uh, great to be chatting to Arturas and some of our brokers this morning. We're going to give everyone a few more minutes because people are still signing signing on. And we've got a really great uh, session this morning. Um, we're going to be chatting with Mamweti and with Brian Habana, and we'll tell you more, more about him just now. So Mamweti, why don't you say how's it to some Arturas and our brokers, and we'll get going in a couple of minutes. Morning, everyone. I think it's just been such a festive week for not only I2, but the entire country, if not the continent and beyond. Um, so we're really happy to just keeping the, the Gears train going, keeping the spirits alive, keeping our national pride alive. And it's so good to have a national hero online with us this morning. So shortly after all of our celebrations and continuing on celebrations. So welcome to Brian. Thank you for making the time to, to chat with us this morning. Um, I see there's actually about 205 people on the line so far, but it should be climbing up. Thank you all for making the time to join us, just to join in on the celebrations and hear some some golden nuggets from, from Brian. And what I will say to everyone, that if you're in the Joburg area and you're near the R2 offices, we are having a Book Friday celebration. So if you feel like a booty roll or a cold beer, please pop into the R2 offices at one o'clock this afternoon. And we'll be here in our book here, and we'll be carrying on the chias, as Mamwedi said. So I think let's get going with the talk and the presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Brian Habana. And I don't think Brian needs much of an introduction. I was thinking about how to introduce Brian. Um, he's probably more famous than even me on our Tuesdays. Um, <laughs> but he's our most famous uh, Springbok, uh, one of our most famous of, of all time. He's a previous World Cup winner. He's a fintech entrepreneur and just generally a great South African. So Brian, it's really good to have you with us today. And Brian, and we're gonna be talking leadership lessons from sports and a few other things. And after that, we're gonna have some competitions and prizes. We're going to be giving away some of this uh, IT gin. If you can see it, I've got to just get it right because there's a background on. <laughs> but you all know the famous IT gin. We've got a couple of bottles of IT gin, which is very hard to get your hands on. So we're going to have a little quiz um, after Brian's talk. So look out for some, keep your fingers ready and look out for some uh, some questions where you can win some IG gin. And then we'll have time for some questions and answers uh, with Brian after that. So Brian, thank you so yeah. much for joining us um, as we celebrate Book, Book Friday and all the good stuff that's going on in South Africa. Over to you and we're looking forward to your presentation. Good morning, Justin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's weird to think that... Uh, do we go box for Protea Fridays? Well, what do we go now seeing that the box aren't playing anymore? <laughs> I think it's 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 really weird. I was actually doing a, a, a video myself and Dan Carter shared a broadcast channel over the last week or so. And I actually was getting FOMA. I'm like, how do we get over these last two months? Right. <laughs> it's gonna be um uh, pretty somber. But Cape Town is putting on a little bit of a show. Obviously, the box. Have been insane over the last 48 hours. They, you know, had the trophy tour starting in Johannesburg and Victoria yesterday. I think they got to Cape Town at about 9:30 last night with a couple of thousand fans, um, you know, waiting, waiting for them. And they've literally just started their their tour in Cape Town this morning. And and rightly so, I think this team has done some absolutely astounding work over the last six years. I think get to this point, they've immortalized themselves not just in South African folklore. But in world rugby folklore, you know, the first South African team to win back-to-back -back rugby world cups, the first team to ever win four <laughs> rugby world cups, and you think we could have potentially won more if we'd actually played in the first two in '87 and and '91. So I think uh, New Zealand and Australia are pretty happy that we weren't because um, yeah, four out of eight we've never lost a rugby world cup final, even though we came pretty close last weekend. But the resilience, the perseverance, and determination in which that team showed last week was hopefully symbolic for where we are as a country. We all understand how many problems we have. I think from an SME perspective, in terms of how we're driving this country, it's going to be incredibly important. So Justin, uh, Mamuete, thank you very much for the invite. I'm not quite sure, just, I know there's a potential gym up, gym up for prizes a little bit later, but I mean, for those of us that aren't in Joburg and can't come to the I2 offices, I mean, do we get Burivals roll vouchers or something? How does it work? Yes, we're going to be sending you borrow, of course, uh, roll vouchers. And we do have an office in Cape Town and Durban. So if you're a broker and you're in the area and you want to pop in for a drink, <laughs> um, do that. And uh, Brian no, will brilliant. make a plan to get your borrow <laughs> roll voucher. And would love to have a beer with you sometime next time you're in Joburg. No. 
Definitely, just hundred percent. So, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just quickly share my screen, um, and sort of we can chat for about twenty minutes, and I'm gonna maybe just go through certain principles that I think you know play an important role, particularly in terms of leadership, in terms of where we're going. And I guess brilliant, firstly, from an IT perspective, that you know fry yays is happening, and that bottom right hand corner, um, it's like a regular Friday but better. I think in South Africa, it's um almost much better given the fact that the box have become victorious and have just really shown the power of sport, but also set an example of, you know, if you are willing to work extremely hard, you know, put your differences aside, what incredible success can be achieved. And I honestly believe that can transcend into the workplace and the Springbok team, you know, with such an incredibly diverse background has given us some, this country so much to celebrate and um, our uniqueness, our cultural diversity, but knowing, you know, how strong the force of a team is. So, this Friday is like a regular Friday, but just a lot better. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm named after Brian Robson and Gary Bailey, so two Manchester United sporting icons. Um, I was I grew up you know, born in the late in the early 80s and growing up wanting to be the next South African export into the English Premiership to play for Manchester United. So to those non-Manchester United fans that have been ripping us to pieces over the start of the season. I know it is the worst start that United have ever had. I'm a very fair weather United fan. And today I'm just a Springbok. So I actually don't care about your negative com comments. Um, hopefully Mr. Ten Hag will at some point get it right. But it has, it's been, been rather disappointing. But I yeah, grew up, I think, I thought I was pretty stylish as, as a youngster. I, I, I mean, if social media was around in, in the late 80s, I definitely think I could have potentially been a TikTok sensation. I mean, my dress sense was just absolutely phenomenal, right? Um, I I thought I thought I had it all. Um, rugby was the furthest thing from my mind in '95. I mean, I was a soccer playing athlete that would run and try score soccer goals. Um, but what that moment, and I obviously can't see all 366 hands on the call now, but. I'm not quite sure who was around on the 24th of June in South Africa in 1995. This next slide, I'm going to chat about after the slide plays. Uh, well done, Noah, you were with me. I, I did tell Mamoeti yesterday, I think she was maybe like three years old, four years old. Her and Andre Pollard very much the same. But this next slide played an, an incredibly pivotal role in changing the course of my life. Back it comes to you, Sven de Vestesen. A little knock forward, but that's it. South Africa have won the World Cup. Having been back in international rugby for less than three years and having not taken part in the first two competitions, at their first attempt, they have stolen the crown. Unbelievable scenes all around the park. Francois Pina, as you can see, absolutely in tears. Pina, who had a lot of criticism as captain on the field, they all knew he had what it took off the field, a tremendous ambassador. He's probably on the field now. And the whole of South Africa behind him. A momentous occasion. And just looking even at the flags and the supporters there, I can't tell you how much this place has changed in the last three years. When we came to see the first match back after isolation, it was all the old South African flag. There still wasn't a black face to be seen. But now it really is this rainbow nation all behind their team. Kitch Christie, the coach, who's also been criticised a tremendous amount for his selections, everything's worked. Crazy Pinar with him, his assistant. Chester Williams there congratulating Brendan Pinter on getting onto the field. Incredible scenes. President to the captain. There it is. Francois Pinard. 
and Nelson Mandela. So hopefully for those of you that were around in 95, that brought back some memories. Um, for those of you that were emotionally connected to it in some way or form, um, you, know, you, you almost can taste, feel exactly what you're feeling at that specific moment in time. As a 12-year-old boy, I was fortunate enough to be sitting in Ellis Park when that 747 flew overhead, when Joel Skransky dropped that incredible, probably one of the most perfect drop kicks that have ever been kicked. When Francois looked at that trophy and said it wasn't for the 60,000 in the stadium, you know, or we didn't have 60,000 in the stadium, we had 43 million South Africans behind us. Um, there was a little 12-year-old boy sitting there witnessing, yes, history being made, but more importantly, the power that sport has to inspire, in, inspire and give hope and dreams. And, you know, that was an ex an extremely pivotal moment in my life. Um, you know, I'd never played the game before. Went to King Edward the Seventh School the following year and, yeah, I thought, like, you know, given what happened last year, I'm going to, this rugby thing is, is going to be what I'm going to do. And sort of we had this coming together of various boys from all around you know, the country and Johannesburg, you know, in form one, it was so called uh, grade eight, uh, standard six. And they sort of did these various elements of sort of testing how quick you were, could you pass? So I was pretty quick. I couldn't pass with my left hand. I was horrible at kicking a box kick. I was the shortest guy in the grade. My shoulder pads, when worn, literally hit my whole neck. So I was the scrum off. But because I was just so poor at rugby, I started off in the under 14 G side of care. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I know there's a lot of insurance brokers and you know very clever statisticians and mathematicians on the call. Um, you didn't you don't have to guess how bad I was, but just not being able to play a game that I'd been inspired to play by this team, you know, a year prior was just the most incredible thing ever. And yes, the journey you know, culminated you know a few years later in getting to represent the country, but just that ability to understand the power of sport and how it changed my life for, for the better was absolutely brilliant. Fast forward 26 year or 20, uh, 28 years. Where are we now? Uh, yeah. 20, 24 years on, right. Uh, from 95, 28 years on from 95. And not quite sure where everyone was on Saturday when this happened. seeing and witnessing images of the first black African captain to not only do it once, do it twice, create history in the Springboks becoming. Um, can we maybe just pause it there? Um, I think we need to take a, a note at how Cheslin, as incredibly excited as he was to have the flag, um, getting drenched in a flag when doing a trophy lift is probably not the most ideal. He gets stuck for about five seconds, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, but that moment was incredible. And I got to be in Paris witnessing it. And the it was wet, it was raining. That's but the it celebrations. All. Rugby World Cup 2023, done and dusted. Sia Khaleesi and the boys have pulled it through. World Cup champions, two times in a row. How amazing. Well done. Super proud, Baka. So I was super proud, but then I also got to share this moment with Sia. I know there's quite a few jealous people on, on the call now. Um, but I think as amazing as that was, you know, I've been very fortunate over the last five years since retiring in, in 2018, you know, to go through a transition period to Justin's point, you know, start a you know, few fintech companies and you know, get into the, the tech space a little bit. And you know, as we go through this, I'd just love to share a few of my considerations of things that, you know, taking from the rugby field to the boardroom that have been incredibly important in, in my transition phase. And hopefully there's a nugget or two that you feel, you know, can be carried on, you know, in, in your own personal circumstances. They say the one constant in life is change. And I think the ability to go from an elite sporting professional level where you're adored, you're showered with gifts, incredible remuneration, you get a run out into a crowd of 80,000 in front of a crowd of 80,000 people, that endorphin explosion, you know, there's, there's nothing much like it in the real world. And everyone asks me, you know, do I miss the game? Looking at the physical monstrosities that play the game now and how intense the game is, I probably don't physically miss the game because uh, I think I'd be a lot 
worse off on a Monday, you know, post the game. But that, that turmoil of change of going from that level to, and I almost related to a mini death because everything you've known for 10 to 15 years, all of a sudden comes to complete stop. And as much as we all want to try preparing and get ready for, you know, the next phase of life, you know, when you 110% fully focus at going to be the best in the world at something, there's not much change or place for balance. And so this balance term is something that I, I struggle with because when you want to be successful in any form of life, you know, balance is pretty much the last thing you can have. Gravitating to a sense of balance, I, I do understand. Um, but if you have three or four silos in your life and you get each and every one equilibrium, which balance is, you know, you're not going to be fully focused at, at achieving that. So how do we cope with the turmoil of change? You know, for me, it was, was really difficult going from that adoration, going from you know, earning a great salary to potentially starting out at the bottom of the food, food chain and just trying to find out to understand that MVP in the fintech space does not mean most valuable player. It means something completely different. So the, that turmoil of change was something that I needed to deal with. I think having the great people you know, in, in my corner, having the understanding of what I needed to do to restart um, was, was really important. But life is going to constantly throw hurdles, challenges, ob you know, obstacles in our way. And how are we as people then able to handle the, those turmoil of change? You know, really sets those that you know are potentially just average or those that excel and exceed um, to to the best ability. Within the professional environment, I feel there's a few elements that can very much easily be translated into you know the corporate space. You know, hard work, sacrifice, and dedication potentially slashed with a little bit of discipline there. Um, and if you don't have those in any form of life, you know, you're probably not going to achieve success. And how do we constantly, you know, refocus, re-energize ourselves, but you know, keep those basic principles that allow us to continue growing, learning, and, and understanding. I think something that the Springbok team showed us over the last six-year period uh, was a key resilience factor. You know, 2017 was one of the worst years that African rugby had ever had. Rusty and Rasmus took charge in, in 2018. And to see the depth that these players have dug themselves through over the last six years, but particularly the last three weeks, um, you know, they've they played the top five teams in the world across the course of this World Cup. Yes, our, our nails are finished. We've all aged 25 years, given the fact that there was one point wins in the last three weeks. But I think the resilience and the determination of this team, understanding the privilege and honor that they have to represent a country, that is so culturally diverse, so uniquely different. Um, the depths that they were able to dig to make sure that they became victorious was a great testimony for all of us. And life throws challenges at you, um, and it's very easy to succumb to those challenges. But you know, those that really can dig and find resilience where few do, you know, are generally the ones who tend to go over. Communication, I tell people that, you know, there's a lot of things in rugby that's translatable. But a lot of things that I need to do different. Um, the communication point for me is one that I really needed to unlearn to be able to learn. The reason being is, you know, I walked into the change rooms at halftime playing against the All Blacks and I looked around the room and there was 14 other CEOs that were male that were very much like me. All of a sudden, yes, I know how to communicate. I know how to speak to this group of people. Fast forward that three years time, I'm running a fintech company with 14 direct reports, all of who are female. You know, on a rugby field, I was removing emotion from decision-making processes because that's what I needed to do to be in my best physical, mental state to make the best decision. All of a sudden, now in terms of communication, you got to be empathetic. You know, you have to be emotionally connected and understood, which I think is, is very different. So yes, you can communicate, but how do you then communicate that well? And how do you give people a platform for reciprocity in terms of communication, I think becomes exceptionally important. One thing that I feel really has played a massive impact in my life is the ability to choose positive. I honestly believe and take it from where it comes. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you as an individual, in my opinion, have a choice that you get to make every morning. And no matter what's happened the day before, no matter what's to come the day ahead, like when you open your eyes, you decide how you're going to approach that day. Now, I feel choosing positive, you know, and I don't always get it right. I'll be the first to take accountability and responsibility. I definitely don't always get it right. But, you know, choosing positive almost creates this circumference of positivity around you. And you know, when people step into that 
bubble or that space, there's an automatic shift and change and how they respond to you and you know, being kind, being respectful, you know, it's, it's all sort of under that. But you know, how do we choose positive, particularly in a world where there's so much distraction and particularly a world that is so divided? Um, you know, we're never gonna have a fully democratic train of thought, way of doing things, you know, whether it be at political or religion, whatever that might be. But the ability for us to choose positive, I think, lays a key cornerstone in how we can make this world a, a better place. Integrity, they say it takes years to build up trust and you know, split seconds to lose it. And I think based on that being ability to choose positive, you know, how are you being true to yourself? Um, how are you being true to those around you? And when you go to bed at night and you look at yourself in the mirror, are you proud of the person that's looking back at you? You know, are you proud of how that person engaged with other people, not only at a leadership level, um, but in terms of how we communicate and, and relate? And you know, integrity is something that this world, again, in my opinion, is potentially lacking in terms of how we respect those those around us. But when you go to bed at night and you actually look in that mirror, um, you know, how proud of you of of the person that's looking back at you. The need to unlearn is a very important point for me, and not just from what happened on the rugby field, but particularly in life, you know, how life was 20, 30, 40 years ago is very different to how life is now. You know, I come from a environment in rugby where I sent out my first tweet ahead of an Italy game in 2010. And I was like, oh, so excited to, you know, excited for the game ahead. And yeah, I'd been with a group of players whose social media was, or un understanding of social media was at an all-time low. So you had the likes of a uh, John Smith, a Victor Matfield, Bucky Sport, uh, um, Percy Montgomery. Yeah, these guys, we just had no understanding of social media. We had a very, very bad game. And I'll never forget going back into the into the, the hotel um, in our post-match debrief. We were poor. We were horribly poor as a team that day. And John Smith ripped me to pieces about sending a tweet before a game, like it was two hours before a game. And I couldn't understand, like, well, I didn't think it affected me, uh, but the perception of how somebody else thought it was, and I would have you know, fast forward you know, 14 years, um, social media is an interaction that every fan gets to have with those. It's not always the truth, but, you know, we expect this sort of real-time collaboration and engagement. And, um, you know, if I didn't learn how to unlearn the process of, you know, the impact that social media could play, you know, I could be stuck. If I didn't learn how to, create decision-making within an emotional context, you know, from a business perspective where I was removing it previously, you know, I'd struggle for a continual growth, which I think is, is really important. Um, and this point is, sorry, the one part is, but world-class growth, I think, you know, particularly if I look at, at I2 and the brand that it's created in terms of, yes, being a, a niche environment, but being so successful in how they, you know, work in a specialized field is, is incredible. And for me, you know, one of the things Jake White said to us, said to me when I first got my Springbok jersey in, in 2004, when I made my debut against England, um, he said that you're going to get this jersey, but leave it in a better place uh, that you, you know, that you received it. And that was always a thought of consideration that I'd love to do. But Heineke May then also said to me, like, if you want to be number one, uh, you got to train like you're number two. And when I got my Springbok jersey for the very first time, scoring a try against the then world champions, England, at the home of rugby Twickenham, you know, with my first touch of the ball, international rugby, I was like, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. This is the best moment of my life. And I was like, I understand this privilege. I understand this honor. But I don't just want to feel like this for one test match or two test matches. You know, I want to try, be there for 10, 20, 50. You know, can I, can I get to that very elusive milestone of playing 100 test matches for my country? And, and throughout my career, there were highs and lows, and everyone always remembers the good times 99% of the time because that's how you felt when you were emotionally connected to that moment. But there were a lot of times when I was at an all-time low. Uh, you know, 2010 against Australia in Bloemfontein, I get booed off the field by 43,000 South Africans, um, 43,000 South Africans that didn't understand how much time, effort, dedication I put into wearing that Springbok jersey and how badly I wanted to do that jersey proud. Um, but then, you know, you sit there and no one else understands what's like being booed by, you know, 43,000 of your own countrymen and women where you've only ever wanted to to do the jersey proud. And it was in moments like that where I needed to learn, you know, how to get back to being the best, where I couldn't just think that I was the best the whole time and how I was doing 
things differently, how I was adapting, you know, how I was constantly searching for, you know, for what's to come. And that world-class growth in in through learning became really important throughout my career and you know, culminated in, you know, me being very fortunate enough to win a couple of you know, South African Player of the Year, a couple of trophies um, throughout the world, whether it be in South Africa or in France, you know, win a World Cup, you know, score a, a massive number of, of tries. But it was that, you know, constant wanting growth, which I think was was incredibly key and important. Um, as I wrap up the last slide, I want to ask each and every one of you, what is your insurgent mission? Um, you know, when you're at the coal face, how bold is that mission, firstly, individually, and then as an organization, uh, and how are you you doing that together? And how, how do you stay true to that mission on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis? And how often are you reflecting on how that can can be improved? I think something that we all really need to understand is is that front line of obsession. You know, how how curious are you about how the business and, and the end result is working and the details thereof at the front line? You know, do we understand the consumer? Do we understand the the niche environment in which we work, the opportunities that exist there? And, you know, and, and how are we constantly being obsessed with making sure that we improve that front line and the connection that we have to it um, for our own success, but also for, for their success. Everyone says, oh, yes, you must, you must be so great being, you, know, you must be so motivated waking up every morning being a Springbok rugby player. I'm like, if I need being a Springbok rugby player to motivate me, <laughs> it's going to be a very, very short-term solution. Um, you know, being able to have the privilege and honor of waking up every day doing something you love. Yes, you've been blessed with the talent from God to, you know, to do this thing, but to earn a great salary, travel around the world, have experiences very few people get to have. Like, I don't need motivation for that. That is that is such a short-term solution. And, and how I then put certain elements of hard work, dedication, sacrifice, resilience into place. You know, the motivation would be, you know, I want to one day become a world-class rugby player that gets remembered forever. You know, that's the motivation. So, if we're sort of looking at these far-fetched realities for motivation, uh, it becomes a short-term solution. But how you then install key elements within your daily life and and little things done well over a long period of time, you know, leads to incredible success. So, yes, motivation should be there. Motivation should always be something that we you know we we need to have in our ecosystem environment. But it is a short-term solution, you know, because you can dream of being a a great rugby player. You can dream of you know winning the most clients. But if you're not prepared and willing to put in the effort to get to that point, um, you know, motivation is only going to take you that far. In a world that is so confusing, in a world that is so different, um, depending on which eyes you look through the world at, I think as individuals, we need to determine and define our own version of success and, and how we do that appropriately, because that becomes important in our interactions with, with everyone else, but our interaction with where, with where life could potentially take us. Servant courageous leadership, I think in South Africa, you know, particularly at political level, um, I'm not quite sure any of us who are incredibly, you know, satisfied with where our country is going, um, and how are we then, as you know, small, medium, you know, or, or businesses, really showing some servant or courageous leadership in making this this world, you know, a better place, and you know, sometimes you know, getting our hands dirty and and making sure we provide that difference. Being humble, I think for me that was one of the things as a rugby player. I didn't always get it right. I'll, I'll be hundred percent honest, but um, I understood that life got you know I've got given an incredible life, and you know accepting that opportunity, but remaining you know as personable as possible in in, in that was was really important. Um, sorry, this was gonna take a little bit longer. Like the box took uh, seventy eight minutes to to win win games. Um, yeah, don't don't just work for yourself. I think in an environment where we're at, you know, we've got a country that really needs people stepping up, really needs incredible leadership. And you know, how are we impacting, you know, outside of our own personal ecosystem becomes in, incredibly important. And the last one, respect is earned. So so be an example. Uh, you know, how are we, you know, how are we continuously improving this world and and doing it, doing it appropriately. So Justin, I know I took a little bit longer um than what I should have. Um, I'm hoping there was a bit of nugget of information in those last 20, 22 minutes. Um, I'm not quite sure if we're going to answer or ask questions now, just, or if we're going to open the forum up. Perfect. Uh, Brian, thank you so much. And I really enjoyed uh, listening to all of that. I was writing some notes and I'm sure we're going to live some of that certainly here in R2. So thank you very much for sharing 
um, some of those lessons and, and just your, your manner and the way you go about it has been really great. So we're going to have a little poll first. Um, and what yeah. I've done is I've taken off my background so everyone can see the R2 gin that we have here. It's called the Underwriter because that's what we do here. And it's a London dry gin, um, specially, specially distilled um, by I2ers and for I2. So we're going to have a couple of these to give away. And Brian, we'll make sure that we get your bottle down to Cape Town. So we'll arrange that after this. Thanks, and I've yes. had many, many people since I did a social media post on this gin asking me for a bottle of this gin. So if you're on this call and you're listening, here's a chance to get a bottle of this very cool art of gin. So I'm going to hand over to Tove now, and we're going to run a quick poll of a few um, fun questions um, uh, that Brian has shared with us. And fastest finger first, um, we are going to give you some bottles of gin. So here we go. Um, Tove, over to you, and let's have the poll. I'm just checking if everybody can see the poll. Yes, we can yep. see it. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, please, can you answer the first question, which is how many international tries did Brian score? And Brian is, is on the call, so he can let us know what the correct answer is after everybody has answered. We've got 102, which is leading at the moment, but there's only one person who's answered. Okay, so I think people are answering all the questions first. We're going fast finger first. How are we working? Sorry. The question three, question three had no question. Let's give question three. We'll go straight to question four. That was just to check if everybody's awake. <laughs> we should have been Googling you and not Pollard, you see. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> just, um, Mamoeti, don't say we. Don't say we. Don't say we. <laughs> Listen, I, okay. I. <laughs> so yesterday I was giving uh, Brian a bit of a hard time. Um, I'd mentioned one too many box and it's kind of shortlisted him. After the session now, Brian, you're number one. Listen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. these are amazing words L of wisdom. <laughs> I mean, basically for everyone listening, Mamweti nasty told Brian that she was, he was her, her third favorite spring box. <laughs> But Brian, I, was like, I think you've done some good job today. If you, that, if you was it third? I, I don't even think I made top three, right? It was like <laughs> Sia, Andre, <laughs> Damien, Jesse, Cheslin. I mean, I'm trying Elizabeth, to Elizabeth, all of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I was just upset. I wanted you to be here in person, but you can come to our year and function in a couple of weeks. Don't okay, worry about sure. it. <laughs> Thanks, my mate. Appreciate, appreciate that. Um, Tobe, so I think, yeah, everyone, I'm not quite sure how many people are still voting. Are we going to? If we're gonna go fastest finger first, uh, give it another couple of minutes or seconds. I'm not quite sure how you a want to go few, through them. A few more seconds, please. Okay, cool, perfect. Has anyone got four out of four yet? And that's sort of what we need to understand, right? So I don't have the stats in the background. So how are we gonna do this? So you're gonna be the judge and tell us who's winning. Caesar has Caesar has dethroned me, so I can't um I can't see the results. So what we'll do is um when we get the report back from Zoom, we'll just let okay. the winner cool. know everyone now. Okay. Next I Tuesday. Cool. Perfect. That works. Definitely works. Do you want to tell us what the correct answers are, Brian? Please. Just put yeah, everybody yeah. out of their misery. Out of their misery, 100%. Okay, cool. Um, are we still going to let people vote? Only 49% have participated. Yes, 50. Oh. But I, I'm not going to start telling the answers until everyone. <laughs> Either we must stop <laughs> or we're going to end the poll. I think we must end the poll. Okay, if, perfect. If you're, if you're too late now, you're too late. Okay, there cool. we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, fantastic. So um, 100%. I did managed to saw quite a few tries throughout my career 102 would have been phenomenal um but unfortunately <laughs> it wasn't that many uh there are 69 or 30 percent of the group that got it right it was 67 well done Giselle um, that's incredible Woo so 67 which means that um yeah I'm, I'm second on the all-time list Unfortunately, I've already lost to Japan once in my career, and I'm now behind a Japanese player. Um, in so the Japanese player scored 69 tries in I think 72 tests. It's actually a phenomenal try scoring ratio, which was, which was brilliant. Um, South African player of the year. Um, not all the answers that was wrong. 
Sorry, that was I'm not quite sure. They, they, I'm just seeing two answers here, right? But that none of those are right. <laughs> Sorry, I, I want to take responsibility for this, but I can't. <laughs> Um, Sorry about so, that, Brian. So tell us, how many times did you win South African Player of the Year? So, yeah, so first one was in 2005, pretty special as a 22-year-old. 20, yeah, um, you know, I think I beat uh, Skulkberg, Fred uh Victor Matville that year. It was pretty special. I then did it again in 07, uh, which was pretty special, and then capped it off in 2012 to tie Nars um, um as yeah, the only spring book that won it three times. And then Peter Steftetoy got three times in a row in 2019 and what a phenomenal performance he had. So three was the correct answer, which was not on there, unfortunately. And then untitled question number three, um, I want to say 28% of the people were right. Um, so skip there was, that one, Sove. Yeah, no, no, I know we said skip okay. that there, no, there was no question there. Um, and then number four, which club in France? Je pas sûr si il y a quelques personnes françaises en, en cet uh, appel de Zoom ou pas. Il y a quelqu'un ou non? Pas Frank, du tout? Frank. Pardon? Pardon? <laughs> Frank, Pardon. Frank. Oui, oui. <laughs> Ryan, with that French oui, accent, je... I think you now are officially Mamouetti's favorite. Oui, mais si, si je peux, euh, parce qu'avec elle, je ne suis jamais sûr, mais si elle veut, elle veut prendre moi pour un petit café, on peut faire bien sûr. So uh they are um so those that say Racing 92, horribly wrong. That is actually where Sia Khaleesi is going um in a week's time. Biarritz, also incorrect. Uh Stade Francais is in Paris, and as much as I would love to be in Paris, it um was not that. 47% of you said to lose. Um, unfortunately, you're also wrong. Um, I was actually in fact in Toulon down south on the Côte d'Azur. Uh, J'étais là pour cinq ans, so I was there for five years. So, uh, Tova, you're going to have to see who got the Toulon one first right. How many times did I start on the bench in my 124 test matches? Ooh, there's a little bit of um, me. Merci, Charel. Uh, je vous en prie, madame. Uh, comme tu veux, uh, je sais, mais... Pour, pour la prochaine question. Um, so, oh, how many times did I stop? Inclusive, guys. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, there's a very wide ranging number of answers on how many times. So, my first test match back in 2004, I was, was actually on the bench. So, I came off, I came onto the field for Jean de Villiers. And yeah, that was number one. Number test match one of 124. So my first and my second one off the bench was in 2007 against Tonga, which we almost lost. Uh, people forget how we almost did lose against Tonga and Fiji in, in 07. And my third one never happened. So it was only two, which 26% of the group got. So Tova, you're going to have to say who got fastest finger first on number two. And then question number six. So how many World Cup tries did I score? Um, a varying number throughout the actual answers. So eight was what I <laughs> just also, also can't understand. Um, so eight <laughs> I scored in 2007 to equal Jonah Loma's record for most number of tries in a men's rugby World Cup. And funnily enough about that stat, everyone was talking about breaking the eight this year so every eight years since 99 when jonah scored eight tries in the 99 world cup a player has scored eight tries so in 07 it was myself scoring eight two against argentina in the semi-final to equal that record didn't touch the ball much on attack in the final and that was only a kicking affair 2015 julian Sevilla scored eight um in in that world cup that new zealand won back to back and then will jordan uh, scored eight in this year, and he should have scored nine if Richard Mwanga had just passed him a ball. But Sia Khaleesi told me after the game that they weren't going to let the uh, World Jordan score, um, which means that the eight has been preserved for another another few years. 102 would have been amazing um, to score 100. And, uh, oh, no, so that's how I try, sorry. Um, um, 9, 21, 13 are all incorrect. So I equal Jonah Loma's record for the most number of tries at the Men's Rugby World Cup in totality. It took Jonah two tournaments to score 15. It only took, 
it took me three. So I'm not saying Jonah's better than me, but yeah, 15 tries throughout three World Cups, which is uh, not too bad a record to have. Good stuff, Brian. Thank you for um, for sharing some of that great information about yourselves. And thanks to Tobe for running the poll. Um, so we will um, add up and look at the results and analyze them. And we will let all of you know who wins a bottle of this uh, this great R2 gin. And we'll be in touch and make a plan to get it to you. We've got a bit of time left. So I thought, Brian, it'd be cool just to chat informally and to ask you a 100%. couple of questions. Um, so if you do have questions, please put them on the chat. And we'll try and answer as many as we can. We've got a few coming through. Yeah, I see so we'll some. I see Samantha has already also. I'm I'm going to look at the Q and A um chat box. I know there's potentially a lot of Perfect. chats in the actual chat. Um, so I'm going to answer this one live, Samantha. Um, yeah, I mean, I I was extremely honored and humbled to have you know done what I did for the length of time that I did it. I missed gym this morning. Um, it's now the fifth year in a row. Um, I've been absolutely horrible training wise over the last five years since retiring in June 2018. Main reason is probably a bit of laziness. I think when you've been at that level for such a long period of time, I've got a bit of a mental block against it and you know, starting a fintech company, traveling quite a bit at the minute, um, and then being a dad. Uh, yeah, it just doesn't mean fitness is a top priority for me at the minute. I have picked up a few kilos um so i might need to start at some point training again but yeah haven't yeah no training is not top priority so i'm very grateful for genetics because even though i have put on a few kilos i'm not really looking like it i'm, I'm dad bod is um <laughs> my four years old and then 95 and my matey um yeah the dad bod is real um my kids um yeah my kids <laughs> have um kids are, are the best they are so blue brutally honest at times um yeah, so I, and i try to avoid like taking my shirt off around them <laughs> which is really uh really weird uh carl for Ma what 2023 dan what is your view on our player depth for the next few years so oh wow i think what rusty and jock have done phenomenally well carl is that they've really opened up and cast the net wide for a long you know a long period of time i think there's been just just over 60 or 70 players in the last four years that you know played in the springbok environment and everyone talks about the springbok team having to move on and yeah that you have the likes of a Dwayne for and dion furry Vili larue um, i mean Dwayne's 38 dion furry's got the most incredible story two years ago he was playing pro de deux in france you know came back to south africa won the urc um, you know, got selected as a Springbok at 35 years old and was the captain on the field when the final whistle went um, at the age of 36. I mean, it's a, I mean, as fairy tale stories go, that's phenomenal. But those are sort of the only three real players that are going to be ending their career. Um, Andre Pollard is only 29 years old. Sia Yevon and Franz Malherbe are 31. So even though this is the oldest group on average that went to a World Cup, I think there's going to be quite a handful of them that are going to be around. I think Evan's going to be... Cheers, Geralda. Uh, lovely to have met you. Sorry that um, yeah, we're going a bit longer, but hope that the, your next meeting is as fry yay as this one is. Um, so I actually think this the core of this group will be around for for the next World Cup. Uh, you know, Jesse Creel, also only 29 years old, and you have the likes of Kanan, Moody, Kirtley, Aaron, Sir, you know, Cheslin, I think, is also just turned 28 or 29. So I think we've, we've, we're going to do pretty well. Rassi has this cast the net out. I think where South Africa goes in terms of structure, you know, do we play our rugby up north in terms of Six Nations or joining the Six Nations? I, I don't really know. But I'm pretty confident that given Rassi is still around for the next two years, that there'll, you know, be a little bit of continuity, which I think is, is great. And who knows, uh, Dwayne Vermeulen might actually become a part of that Springbok coaching staff, which will be pretty cool. David Greenway, can you chat about your work with Matt Kitt and how important it is to give athletes working on their finances and livelihoods after the game dave thanks very much for for that question i, I was fortunate enough to have started you know retroactive a digital sports marketing company uh when i retired in in 20, 2018 mike shaman my you know former uh school friend you know sort of approached me and said listen let's do this together and i was standing on the field in japan in 2019 when that box team won and looking out of the field and having a bit of a marketing brain on me i realized that not one of those players on the field had their own dot-com websites which was for me not something that you needed to have but at least like three or four scattered around and 
because I've been fortunate enough to, you know, from a marketing perspective, build a brand you know, that was able to leverage off that when my career came to an end. It was just really, I just couldn't understand why, you know, no one had actually integrated these people. And I went to go look at you know, Sia's website was being, was being sold like for 1.2 million rand, which I was like, wow, you know, and he didn't have those rights. And we actually created Match Kit to be able to give athletes and not just rugby players, firstly, the platform, because you have all these social media idiosyncrasies, you know, you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and all, all these various things. And, and we sort of just built Match Kit firstly to give players a platform that holistically encompasses what they are and, and what they're doing. And you know, we we saw opportunity, you know, during COVID to you know, try and monetize things where players were having to train at home. You know, contracts were being cut and and do things that that made things a little bit easier for them. So it's been an incredible journey. I think also being you know with Payme now from a fintech perspective, understanding the importance of tech, and it's been amazing to see the number of players, unions, federations trying to plow back in giving players the skill sets you know that are needed when the next phase of life comes about. One of the things I've also realized, and I was very much like this when I was playing, and when you're in that bubble, you don't realize that it is a bubble. And you don't realize that the salary you're earning now is unrealistic comparatively to you know anywhere else in the world. And you know, all of a sudden, that bubble bursts and you re realize the real world is pretty tough. And I tell people, you know, it's there's a 0.000058% chance if you play schoolboy rugby in your final year of school, are becoming a Springbok rugby player in the next decade. So they take the number of schoolboy rugby players, um, you know, in their final year of school, and they look at the number of Springbok rugby players over a ten-year period. There's only ever been nine hundred and forty-three Springboks, you know, since eighteen ninety-six, and not that you can't become a professional rugby player, but the number that becomes Springbok rugby players is very small. So you realize how incredibly fortunate you are to be doing that. Um, but then you also realize that the real world isn't quite like that. You know, as a rugby player, you have two days off a week. <laughs> you get to play golf on a Thursday. And even though, you know, your bags are being on a Sunday night, you get a program telling you where to be, what to be wearing, with clothes that you've been given for free, who's going to be, you know, taking it, and you're going to be driven and flown there. Your life is very, very simple and easy, even though it's a very few that get to live that privileged life. So, yeah, I think it's it's a constant engagement on understanding what you like and how you can use your brand to leverage off the next phase. You know, if you can't do a you know, PowerPoint presentation, read a Excel spreadsheet, you know, potentially pivot table on an Excel spreadsheet or read a budget or forecast, you know, the next phase of life is, is pretty tough. You never have to do that as a rugby player. So I think there's a lot being done. A lot more can be done, but because of the uniqueness of such a wide variety, you know, trying to equip each and every individual player with that tool set is, is very difficult. So I'd love to be a positive symbol of hope in terms of what it is possible, but also understanding that not everyone can make it. You know, there's a few select that can potentially go on TV, you know, be part of a brand, which is really difficult. Anonymous attendee, how do you balance the pressure of the boardroom uh, being a rugby analyst and family? Oh, it's if I had the correct answer to that. And again, I said balance is the last thing one can have. Um, you know, I've been traveling quite a bit over, over the last four years. I want to say almost double or triple to what I was as a rugby player, you know, using the opportunities that are presenting myself, whether it be on you know, international broadcast, the likes of ITV, Prime Video, Channel 4, being an ambassador for Mascot, HSBC, Land Rover, uh, Marks.com. So, and then also still running, you know, a fintech company. And, you know, I sort of joke with my fellow co founders, they found out um, they came to the semi final, fortunately, for, for the weekend, and, and they found out that I'd submitted. Um, I think 18 unpaid leave days for <laughs> for October and they they were pretty pissed off with me Um, but I just felt that you know as a as a leader in the organization even though I was available at times throughout the course of the World Cup because I wasn't present I felt that you know there were certain sacrifices that I had to make and I think you know sometimes we look at balance and sacrifice in, in the same effort you know to be the best you know chief client officer pay me now you know to be a, a good rugby analyst or to be a good family man there there is unfortunately going to be a lot of sacrifice that is re as required and you know this concept of balance you know it's gravitating towards it is great but if you want to be successful you know in any one of those silos so for me to you know handle the pressure of a boardroom you know balance is the last thing that i can be able to have if i don't understand what's happening you know at the coalface of the business 
you know, being a rugby analyst, if I'm not trying to be as neutral and unbiased as possible and only seeing the game through a Springbok tinted set of glasses, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to have balance. You know, then with family, you know, given my work, given the ambassadorial stuff that I'm doing, I'm not as present as much. So how am I when I'm there you know, giving the time necessary to that environment, which I think is is really important. Uh, Louise, how do you balance life? I think I've already mentioned that. I don't. To be honest, I don't. I, mm -hmm. I've got an incredible wife, um, you know, who I'm so, so grateful for, for the effort that she puts in in raising our boys, making our house a home. Um, you know, I think this year alone, I've had 102 flights. Um, I'm not going to be doing any sustainability campaigns anytime soon, but um, I just haven't had balance. You know, and it's trying to search for those opportunities that you know, I'm working hard for now that in three or four or five years time, I can, you know, hopefully have a little bit more time at home, a little bit more time with the boys, but it's not easy. And again, being fully accountable, balance is the last thing I have at, at the minute. Uh, Giselle, other than being boot off the field, what is the darkest moment in your rugby career? Giselle, there was more than one, right? Um, so being boot was pretty, that was the lowest point of my career. Losing 49-0 to Australia in in Brisbane in 20, 2006 was pretty intense. Losing to Japan um, in 2015 was horrendous. Losing to Italy for the first time in the Springboks history um, in my last test match for South Africa, so my 124th test match, you lose to Italy um, in an, a, a very dark time in South African rugby history. So how did I, yeah, how did I get out over it? It's, it's not a simple answer. I think firstly, there was a lot of introspection needed um, for me to understand why that situation had come about, you know, how responsible and accountable was I in, in that environment. It was then not always listening to the sheep, um, you know, the people that had opinions, uh, but more listening to the people that I trusted through their opinions and accountability that they had in my life. So whether it be family, coaches, teammates, you know, players that really understood my environment, you know, leaning off that. A lot of the times it was going back to the basics because you know, they say the tallest trees catch the most wind and then the dogs decide to urinate at the bark. Um, you know, so you know, when you're at that level, you're going to get so much more than what every other person gets and not everyone understands that. Um, and I think it is important on that introspection or self-reflection, you know, where you take the accountability because it's very easy to abscond from any responsibility and accountability. But, you know, when you look inwards and you know, start making those changes inwardly, you know, a lot of the outwardly facing things, you know, then fall into place, which I think is, is really important. So you don't, there's no book on how to overcome it. Um, you know, there's no simple method of, you know, do A, B, C, D, E, and all of a sudden you can get back to that level. You know, it requires a lot of grit, a lot of determination, a lot of resilience and an incredible amount of perseverance because you know you're needing to constantly do things better 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 to change things um you know, getting back to the basics was, was really important doing things differently to what you did them before you know, to try have a different outcome because if you just keep doing things the same you're going to get the same outcome so a lot of the times we're almost too scared to want to you know veer into a different direction to to do things uh, appropriately so i'm hoping that sort of answers answers that um, and I know, Sandy, who do you think the next rugby captain is if we can't figure out how to clone Sia? Ooh, I mean, if a person on a call, on this call, can find out how to clone Sia, you are going to make a lot of money. Um, so get working at that pretty quickly. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, this next group of players, you know, has a massive opportunity at their, at their hands. You know, Rassi will be extremely instrumental in terms of how leadership roles will change. You know, we've already seen Jacques Ninaba go on to, you know, to the next stint with Leinster over in Ireland. Andre, again, only 29 years old. I definitely see him you know, having the potential to be a Springbok captain. Uh, you know, he was started at a very young age. He gets praised a lot in terms of his leadership abilities at the minute. And the unfortunate thing is a big part of this group is actually playing overseas at the moment. Um, and, and how that has an impact. I think Seat has done brilliantly to stay in South Africa for, you know, for the for the better part of the last 12 years. And, you know, that, I think that's had a positive impact. So it does the captain need to come out of a south african based team i don't know um it's it's going to be very interesting um, a lot of our players are playing in japan so i don't know who the next rugby captain is going to be to be real brutal honest i haven't been able to to reflect on on that in, in any any way or form there's quite a few putting their hands up at um 
national level. I mean, in, like local level. And it's hoping they progress that to national. I, I don't have an answer for you at the moment. Andre would be my pick. Um, what is going through your head when receiving the Hall of Fame, Carl von Amarva? Um, so yeah, I was very honored and privileged to be receiving the uh, the induction into the Hall of Fame alongside Dan Carter, Jerry Dussetois, George Smith, and Juan Hernandez. A phenomenal honor. And I think for me, really what was going through my head is that it was a, it was as much as it was a personal accolade, it was without a doubt the ability to reflect gratitude to each and every person that had played a part in my career, no matter how small, because uh, I wasn't able to achieve what I achieved as an individual if it wasn't for people around me, you know, whether that be my high school rugby coaches, you know, my family, my wife, my teammates, the coaches who selected me. Um, so it really was almost a show of gratitude for me to be able to say thank you, you know, to all those that played a, a small part on, on my career, no matter no matter how small that part was. Um, Madeleine, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Uh, I think I've, I've been really blessed to understand that rugby you know, has this incredible tool of uniting people and inspiring. I was one of those kids that got inspired in, in 95 and I try to you know, live up the, to the best of that the, throughout the course of my career. Uh, Jonathan, Chris Brown, you look awesome for an almost 40 years old. I am already 40 years old, Jonathan. Um, I am actually 21. I've aged 29 years in the last three weeks, given what the Springboks have, <laughs> have put us have put us through. Uh, what is your favorite fan moment story, except for Mama Eti? Oh, geez, there's so many. And one, but one that sticks vividly in my mind, I'd, I'd just gone to the pools in 2005 and we were playing golf at Woodhill Country Club. And I'm a crap golfer. I love golf, but I'm a very crap golfer. Myself, Bainan Tullafid, Mornay Stain, and I think Johan Roots were playing, if I remember. And it was on the one par three and this little, I think, four-year-old girl probably didn't understand rugby in any way. Like just got out of her dad's golf car and like just ran across this part three and like just gave me gave me the biggest hug in the world. And I understand the discrepancies, you know, our unique past, the part, whatever, but I'd, I'd never seen myself as a person of color. I'd always sort of seen myself as a South African. And you know, that moment was incredibly symbolic of, you know, I was there in 95 witnessing it as a fan, but then to be on the other side and just seeing the power that sport has to, you know, to break down barriers you know overcome hurdles and for people just not see color was was absolutely brilliant and that that image has, has stuck vividly in my mind uh for, you know, for the better part of the last of the last 20 years marley pretorius can you please give a shout out to natasha and marley from the Renka? Renka? i'm not sure how to pronounce that um whoop, whoop. <laughs> I've, I've got a, I've got, I've got a shower voice so i'm not going to go whoop whoop um marley at this moment uh sophie now do we get any financial advice? We get a lot of financial advice, but we also make very bad decisions, which I think is uh, was really, and again, you don't understand that you know, buying the best cars. And I was, one of the worst decisions I made was buying a four bedroom house at 21 years old. Like, it, it's just, like, look back now, it made no sense. It wasn't an investment property. I was you know, living my best life as a bachelor. Um, and it, it actually just cost me, you know, cost me money, which was, which was, wasn't great. So you get a lot of advice. I think that the the worst thing about advice is if you don't know how to act on that, it becomes really difficult to make sound decisions. And as professional athletes, you're not an expert at it. So, you know, you sometimes, firstly, you're an easy target because, you know, people throw these massive claims of great returns. And, you know, the other bad decision I did was actually opening a um, a retirement annuity at 21 um, that escalated at a 10% annual increase not knowing that at 35 I'm not going to be able to afford a 10% annual increase for 14 years because I'm not going to be earning the same salary that it is a regular place. So there's, there's quite a bit of financial advice that gets given. You know, we are easy targets and it's again, trying to have the right people in your corner that you can trust them and, and you have on your side. Um, so I know there's quite a few more questions and I know time is oh, up. Just, I'm not quite Brian, sure. I think we're going to start on. to wrap it up. I mean, uh, I'm sure most yeah. people could listen to you all day um, <laughs> and um Thanks to everyone for all of the, the questions and, and the enthusiasm. Um, Brian, maybe one or two last questions from me quickly. Um, a lot has been spoken about Rassi in this World Cup and what a leader he's been. Um, if you could pick one thing that makes Rassi special as a leader, what would that be? His drive, to, his drive, no matter what the circumstances, to achieve success. 
And I mean, I don't always agree with everything that Rassi does. You know, I've said it quite a number of times. And you know, sometimes how he handles the referee, how he portrays himself on social media is not always, in my opinion, right. Uh, but one thing, you know, Rassi has always been is determined to be successful. He sometimes pushed the boundaries, you know, which you need to do at times to to achieve success. But he's had this unwavering ability to to make sure that he's meticulous in his planning, which I think is incredibly important. But that that meticulous planning leads to delivery, which I think is incredibly important. Uh, thank you, and Brian. And last question, maybe I think one of the legacies of of the Springbok team over the last few years has been diversity and being a great example of diversity for South Africa. Um, can mm -hmm. you comment on that and maybe the different positions and players and different skills and and how is this team a, a great example of of diversity for South African mm -hmm. business and you know in everyday life and what's possible if we all come together mm -hmm. and if we're all stronger together as South Africans? Yeah, so I think I chatted briefly about to highlight that a few points in the beginning. Just um, I think firstly, you know, ninety five was incredible for me. It will remain iconic. Two thousand seven you know, will be incredibly special for me personally because I was able to be there. 2019 for me was without a doubt the best World Cup we'd ever won. And the reason I say that, it was the most transformed Springbok team that had ever graced the field. Follow on from that, it was the first time that anyone scored a try in a Rugby World Cup final, which maybe doesn't say too much about me as a rugby player. But Makazoli Mapimpi was probably the player least likely to be in that position to be scoring the first try for the Springboks in a Rugby World Cup final. And the fact that he was selected, and you know, we all, or most of us probably watched Chasing the Sun, that story of, you know, Rusty saying, you know, crying about his face only being on his number. And the only reason was his face because he had no one. And he was walking 10 kilometers to school in the morning, you know, 10 kilometers back from school in the afternoon, just to get out of his circumstances. And then you have Ches and Colby, you know, backing that up, you know, Gan ridden, you know, as a youngster, people telling him that he was too small, he's never going to make it. And what that side in 2019 showed us is that if we do put our differences aside, because that's, that's I think, the first starting point, Justin, like, we all, we're all going to have differences. But if we are going to collaboratively work to a successful point, we need to be able to put our differences aside. We need to understand that we are all uniquely different, um, you know, because you sometimes want people to think, do, and act like you are. But if you're not willing to put those differences aside, but then retrospectively understand that people are different, that not everyone thinks the same like you, but that we can work together towards a common goal. So, yeah, understand that you know, we can put our differences aside, understand that we are uniquely different and we need to, I want to say encourage being uniquely different. You know, we need to celebrate being uniquely different, but then we also need to work together to achieve a common goal. And achieving that together is unfortunately going to mean sacrifices at some point. You're not going to always be able to do, you know, things that you felt you need to do as, you know, as best possible, but that you do it in a way in which everyone thrives, you know, seeing Sia Khaleesi sing in the tunnel, you know, before a test match. I mean, John Summit, Victor Matfield, Francois Pinar would never, ever have done that, right? But we as South Africans get to celebrate that uniqueness. And that has played an impactful role in how this team operates. You know, we people, you know, someone like Peter Steptoy, who's a farm boy, wears his fellies. Um, he's maybe not going to sing, but he's not going to deter what they're doing, you know, for that, from a team environment perspective, thriving. So it's putting your differences aside, understanding that we are uniquely different and that can be celebrated, but that the sacrifice that we put in together to achieve a common goal will reap incredible rewards. Brian, thank you for those answers. Really, really meaningful and insightful. And thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Um, we're going to wrap it up there. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone that's listened and joined us. Um, if you want to turn off your microphones, if you can, if you're allowed to, and say cheers and shout out to Brian. Um, and we're going to have a great Friday afternoon. So if you're in the Joburg area, join us for a drink. And uh, let's celebrate this Friday and keep the clear going around South Africa. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Mamwiti. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much.